This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 16, for broadcast on the 1st of March, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, seven Earth-like planets discovered orbiting a single star, new clues in the hunt for Planet Nine, and space tourists heading for the moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. For the first time ever, astronomers have found seven Earth-like planets orbiting a single star. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature, includes three planets in the host star's habitable zone. The so-called Goldilocks region around a star, where temperatures are not too hot and not too cold, but just right for liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to potentially at least exist on a planet's surface. The detection also sets a new record for the greatest number of habitable zone planets found around a single star outside our solar system. The system, which has been named TRAPPIST-1, is located some 378 trillion kilometres, or 40 light years away, in the constellation Aquarius, relatively nearby in cosmic terms. The planets are all in very tight orbits around an ultra-cooled dwarf, TRAPPIST-1a, which fits right on the border between the smallest spectral type M red dwarf stars and the largest spectral type L brown dwarfs. The study's lead author Michael Gallon from the University of Liège in Belgium says the seven wonders of TRAPPIST-1 represent the very first Earth-sized planet still being found orbiting a star of this kind. He describes the discovery as providing the best target yet for studying the atmospheres of potentially habitable Earth-sized worlds. All seven of the TRAPPIST-1 planetary orbits are closer to their host star than Mercury's 88 Earth Day orbit around the Sun. The planets are also very close to each other. In fact, if you were standing on the surface of any one of these worlds, you'd be able to gaze up and see geological features, even clouds, on some of the neighbouring worlds, some of which would appear far larger in the sky than the Earth's moon does in our sky. Because they're so close to their host star, the planets are thought to all be tidally locked, which means the same side of the planet always faces the star, just as the moon is tidally locked in relation to the Earth, with the same side always facing us. This means one side of each planet would be in perpetual day, while the opposite side of the planet is in everlasting night. Astronomers speculate this means the TRAPPIST-1 planets would have weather patterns totally unlike those on Earth, with strong winds continually blowing from the day side to the night side, and extreme temperature changes as you move past the terminator, the division between night and day. Moving outwards from the host star, the seven planets have been named TRAPPIST-1b through to TRAPPIST-h. The nearest TRAPPIST-1b orbits the star in just 1.51 Earth days. It has about 1.09 times Earth's radius and about 0.85 times its mass. Next out is TRAPPIST-1c, which circles its star in just 2.42 Earth days. It's about 1.06 times the Earth's radius and about 1.38 times its mass. Then comes the smallest of these newly discovered worlds, TRAPPIST-1d. It orbits the star every 4.05 Earth days. It's just 0.77 times, or about three quarters the radius of the Earth, and has just 0.41 times, or less than half, the Earth's mass. Next is TRAPPIST-1e, the first of the habitable zone planets. It orbits the host star every 6.1 Earth days. It has 0.92 times the Earth's radius and 0.62 times its mass. Another habitable zone planet, TRAPPIST-1f, orbits the star in 9.21 Earth days. It has about 1.04 times the Earth's radius and around 0.68 times its mass. The largest of the newly discovered planets is TRAPPIST-1g, which orbits the star every 12.35 Earth days. It's about 1.13 times the Earth's radius with some 1.34 times our planet's mass. 
Lying just beyond the habitable zone is the most distant and least understood of these newly discovered worlds, TRAPPIST-1h. It's thought to orbit the star about once every 20 Earth days and has about 0.76 times or roughly three quarters of the Earth's radius. But that's about all astronomers know about this distant world as they're not yet able to determine its mass. There's speculation this planet could be an icy snowball-like world, but further observations will be needed. Based on their known densities, all of the TRAPPIST-1 planets are likely to be terrestrial rocky worlds. While it's possible that all seven of these worlds could have liquid water on their surfaces under the right atmospheric conditions, the three in the habitable zone have the highest likelihood. It's hoped further observations will help determine whether they're rich in water and whether that water is pooling as liquid on their surfaces. The planets were all detected by the transit method, whereby the light from the star dims ever so slightly as the planet passes in front of the star as seen from Earth. The discoveries were made during follow-up observations by NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope of a planetary system initially detected by TRAPPIST, the Transiting Planets and Planetesimals Small Telescope, a system of two 60-centimetre robotic telescopes located at the European Southern Observatory's La Silla Observatory in Chile. It was back in May 2016 when astronomers using TRAPPIST first announced that they had discovered three planets in the system. Assisted by several ground-based telescopes, including the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope, Spitzer confirmed the existence of two of these planets and discovered five additional ones, increasing the number of known planets in the system to seven. NASA's Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope, which trails behind the Earth as it orbits the Sun, is well suited for studying TRAPPIST-1 because the star glows brightest in infrared. Last year, Spitzer observed TRAPPIST-1 nearly continuously for 500 hours. The Space Telescope was able to observe enough transits of the planets in front of the host star to reveal the complex architecture of the system. Following up on the Spitzer discovery, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope then initiated a screening of four of the planets, including the three in the habitable zone. These observations were aimed at assessing the presence of puffy hydrogen-dominated atmospheres, typical for gaseous worlds like Neptune, around these planets. In May 2016, the Hubble team observed the two innermost of these planets, finding no evidence for such puffy atmospheres. This therefore strengthened the case that the planets closest to the star are rocky terrestrial worlds. NASA's planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope is also studying the TRAPPIST-1 system, making measurements of the star's minuscule changes in brightness due to the transiting planets. Operating during Kepler's K2 mission, the spacecraft's observations will allow astronomers to further refine the properties of the known planets, as well as searching for additional planets in the system. The Spitzer, Hubble and Kepler data will help astronomers plan follow-up observations using NASA's upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb slated for launch in 2018 aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. With its much greater sensitivity, James Webb should be able to detect the chemical fingerprints for water, methane, oxygen, ozone and other components in the atmospheres of these planets. Webb will also analyse the planet's temperatures and surface pressures, key factors in assessing the habitability. After all, here in our solar system, the Earth isn't the only planet in our Sun's habitable zone. Both Venus and Mars, as well as the Earth's moon, are also in the zone. On Venus, however, the atmospheric pressure is far too high. Any water there evaporated away long ago thanks to the greenhouse effect. While on Mars, the atmospheric pressure is far too low, and the water which was there is thought to have mostly degassed into space. As for the Moon, the only water there is in the form of ice deep on the shaded floor of impact craters near the lunar poles. Planetary scientist Dr Simon O'Toole from the Australian Astronomical Observatory says answering the profound question, are we alone in the universe, is a top science priority. He says finding so many Earth-sized planets like these for the first time in the habitable zone of another star provides a remarkable step towards answering this question. Well, it's a really exciting result. I mean, basically, we know that there are seven planets. They all orbit this very, very cool star. The star is, itself is actually quite small, not that much bigger than Jupiter. It's only about 2,560 degrees Kelvin, so it's very cool compared to the Sun, which is 5,780 degrees. Would you call it an M-dwarf, or is it 
sort of more brown dwarf? It seems um, to be right on that it's border a little, area. It's a little bit of a, uh, a grey area. I think technically it would be classified as an M8 dwarf based on spectral typing, but those stars are sort of borderline brown dwarf anyway. So even though you know we call them M stars and an M star is not a brown dwarf, the M8, M9 sort of stars are pretty close to the brown dwarf boundary, really. I mean, it's 8% the mass of the sun, so it's very arguably a brown dwarf. And that could be really important because red dwarfs, or spectral type M stars, they have very powerful stellar flares because mm. of their internal structure. Whereas once we get into the brown dwarf category, they give up nuclear fusion really early, if they have it at all, and so that becomes yeah. much more stable. That's right, that's right. I mean, even the, the M stars, a lot of them are active only for the first part of their lives, so the first billion or so years. After that, they often settle down, not always. There are some that are just perennially flare stars, but certainly the later type M stars, from my understanding, there's less evidence for flares. I mean, it, it's harder to measure as well. So part of that, there could be a bit of a, a bias against detecting them because the stars themselves are harder to find. And because they're very small observe. and very dim, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, this one, we can certainly, we'll certainly be able to study it a lot better. But now that, you know, it's known that this, there's this planetary system, it's basically going to be observed to death. So we're going to be seeing lots of interesting stuff coming out because people are going to be looking for these flares. And if there's a lot of flares coming through, then you could sort of say, well, habitability is not so likely. I mean, the other thing against habitability might be tidal heating. You have seven planets all orbiting within 25 to 30 days, so they're all very, very close together. So you might get some very, very strong tides. So the moon, Jupiter's moon Io, for example, gets very strong tides from Jupiter, and it is perennially active. It's, there's volcanoes going off all the time. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that that could be an issue, at least on the inner planets. The outer planets, maybe not. So much. In fact, that's what they've been comparing it to, is comparing this TRAPPIST-1 system with the Jovian system. Yeah, totally. And it makes sense. You've got similar sort of orbital periods. Io is, I think, probably even less than a day. I can't remember the exact orbital period of Io. But yeah, certainly all of the, the, the four main moons of Jupiter, uh, the Galilean moons, are quite close together and have similar sorts of orbital periods to this TRAPPIST system. And three of them um, have uh, lots of water, at least in the form of ice, but also liquid water in the yeah, case of at least two of them. That's right, and that is driven by tidal heating. Mm. So you would, uh, and Jupiter is much, much cooler, of course, than Trappist One. That's the the key difference. Jupiter is, you know, only at 160 degrees or whatever it is, 180, uh, whereas Trappist One is two and a half thousand. So you, you, you know, you would expect some warming. Yeah, you get some heating from the the star. But I think that, you know, I wouldn't rule out habitability just based on the idea that there might be flares. We haven't detected any. Not all M stars are flare stars. And as I said earlier, not all flare stars are flare stars forever, at least in our current understanding. So further monitoring of that sort of thing is very, very important if we want to uh, look at that. But obviously, you know, we can point our SETI telescopes, the the various radio telescopes that are involved in SETI should be, will probably be staring at this one for a while as well. So, yeah, I think, and then James Webb and all of those sorts of things. And, you know, even flares, I wouldn't, I'd say that it, it doesn't rule out life. I'd say that it makes it less likely based on life as we understand it. There's a lot of stuff we don't understand about life and things at the bottom of deep, near deep vents in the ocean are probably pretty protected. They've got a very large amount of water above them and there's life there. So, who knows? Who knows, really? How unusual is it to find seven terrestrial worlds in the one system? Uh, Well, this is the first time, so from that point of view, very unusual, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other systems out there. It's hard. It's one of those things where it's very hard to detect. These were detected through the transit method. They were originally detected from the ground, and then they realized there was something funny going on, so they then went to the Spitzer Space Telescope and stared at it for, I think, 20 days or, or thereabouts. And that's where a lot of the, our understanding of the system comes from. But it's a very unusual system because it's very, very close. In the infrared, it's quite bright. In the optical, it's very faint. So even detecting it uh, in the optical is, is, is kind of tricky and figuring out what it is, that it is a very red object and worth following up. So really, whether or not this is a typical system, it might be typical around these kinds of stars, but there aren't that many of them nearby. So I imagine that a lot of a lot of astronomers are going to go around and do a whole lot of photometric monitoring of, sort of very late brown dwarf, uh, M dwarf and, and brown dwarf to see if they can see similar signals and it's maybe opened a new a new area of observational astronomy.
Because the star is so dim in comparison to you know, most stars that we see, does mm. that make it easier or more difficult to look for an atmosphere around the planets? That's a very good question because it's actually it's very dim in the optical, but it's very bright in the infrared, and that's where you might hope to get some evidence of atmosphere of a planet. I, I think probably be still looking at reflected light off the surface of these planets. And I think the James Webb Space Telescope will be well placed. It will have the ability to try and mask out the central star's light and try and see anything else. I mean, I don't expect these planets to be very bright at all because, you know, the only reason we've been able to detect to image any planets so far is because they've been very, very young and large enough that they can, they're still emitting their own heat from their formation. So these objects are very, very small. Their Earth size, their Earth mass, the chances of them of seeing emitted light directly is pretty slim, so you'd have to be looking for reflected light in some way. I was just thinking because the transit method's being used for this, that means the planets yep. are travelling in front of the host star, so the light from the host star would be going through an atmosphere if it's there. That's, that's true as well. That's true as well. Um, although the, the transits and the orbits are so that, you know, because they're so close together, the timing would be it'd be quite difficult to disentangle actually so you'd have you know how do you know that you know what you're actually seeing which planet <laughs> is the light shining you know which planet's atmosphere is the light shining through if it is doing that so it's very very challenging but i think that yeah we're coming to the point where we'll be able to do it soon i'd I dare say, as I said, the James Webb Space Telescope, but perhaps maybe some of the extremely large telescopes, the next generation, sort of 20 to 30 metre class Magellan telescopes might like have that. a chance as well. Yeah, the giant Magellan Telescope and 30 metre telescope and the European extremely, extremely large, large telescope. telescope. They've got to get yeah. a better name for that thing. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's a bit of a shocker. ELT, or the, it's the EELT. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think we're not far away from being able to probe that part of the planetary system, look at atmospheres and that sort of thing. How much more we get out of it remains to be seen because it's a tricky, they're still difficult observations. That's Dr Simon O'Toole from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. And this is Space Time with me, Stuart Gary. Astronomers have some new clues further supporting the hypothesis of a mysterious yet-to-be-discovered ninth planet at the edge of our solar system. The researchers studying a pair of small bodies in the outer reaches of the solar system have determined that they may once have been a single binary asteroid which separated as a result of a past interaction with the hypothetical Planet Nine. In the year 2000, the first of a new class of distant solar system objects was discovered orbiting the Sun at a distance far beyond that of Neptune. These incredibly distant objects are now classified as extreme trans-Neptunian objects. As the name implies, they all orbit the Sun at extreme distances compared to, we'll say, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Our planet orbits the Sun at an average distance of about 150 million kilometres a distance astronomers referred to in shorthand as one astronomical unit. However, these extreme trans-Neptunian objects orbit the Sun at distances of over 150 astronomical units, in other words, 150 times further out than the Earth. Now, by comparison, the most distant known planet in the solar system, the ice giant Neptune, orbits the Sun at about 30 astronomical units. And Pluto, the largest known Kuiper Belt object, orbits the Sun at an average distance of some 39 astronomical units. By the way, the Kuiper Belt is a ring of frozen worlds, comets and icy debris circling the Sun beyond Neptune. For the record, the Voyager 1 spacecraft left the Sun's outer atmosphere, the heliosphere, and officially entered interstellar space at a distance of 121 astronomical units. That followed some 36 years of travel. So far, 21 extreme trans-Neptunian objects have been identified. Recently, a number of studies have suggested that the dynamical parameters of some of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects could be better explained if there were one or more planets with masses several times that of the Earth orbiting the Sun at distances of hundreds of astronomical units. Then in 2016, astronomers observed the strange orbits of seven extreme trans-Neptunian objects, their calculations predicted the likely existence of a ninth solar system planet orbiting the Sun at a distance of about 700 astronomical units. This Planet 9 hypothesis has now become so strong, it's become a major target for study. The problem is, because these objects are so far away, the light we receive from them is extremely weak, 
And up until now, only one of the 21 known trans-Neptunian objects has been spectroscopically observed in detail. That's the dwarf planet Sedna. However, researchers from the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands and the Computer University in Madrid have now begun the task of trying to determine the physical characteristics of more of these bodies and to either confirm or refute the Planet Nine hypothesis. The authors have now made their first spectroscopic observations of two extreme trans-Neptunian objects, 2004 VN112 and 2013 RF98. Both are especially interesting dynamically because their orbits are almost identical and the poles of their orbits are separated by a very small angle. Now that suggests a common origin and their present day orbits could well be the result of a past interaction with the hypothetical Planet Nine. The new findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, suggest that the pair may once have been a binary asteroid, which separated following an encounter with a planet-sized body beyond the orbit of Pluto. To reach their conclusions, the authors first made spectroscopic observations of 2004 VN112 and 2013 RF98 in the visible light range. The job was especially difficult because their great distance means their apparent movement across the sky is very slow. The authors were able to measure their apparent magnitudes, that is their brightness as seen from Earth. They also recalculated the orbit of 2013 RF98, which was previously poorly understood. The visible spectrum can provide details about an object's composition. And by measuring the slope of the spectrum, astronomers can determine whether the target has pure ices on its surface, as was found to be the case in Pluto, as well as highly processed carbon compounds. The spectra can also indicate the possible presence of amorphous silicates, as was detected on the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. The values obtained for both 2004 VN112 and 2013 RF98 were almost identical, suggesting a common origin. They are also very similar to those observed photometrically for two other extreme trans-Neptunian objects, 2000 CR105 and 2012 VP113. Interestingly, however, Sedna, which is the only one of these objects which had previously been observed spectroscopically, shows very different values from the others. These five objects are all part of the group of seven used to test the Planet Nine hypothesis, which suggests that all of them should have a common origin, except for Sedna, that is, which is thought to have come from the inner part of the Earth cloud, a theoretical sphere extending far beyond the Kuiper Belt, which includes long-period comets and interstellar objects caught up by the Sun's powerful gravitational field. To validate their hypothesis, the authors performed thousands of numerical simulations to see how the poles of the orbits would separate as time went on. The results of these simulations suggest that a possible planet 9 with a mass of between 10 and 20 Earth masses orbiting the Sun at a distance of between 300 and 600 astronomical units could well have deviated the pair around 5 to 10 million years ago. This could explain in principle how these two objects, starting as a pair orbiting each other, became gradually separated in their orbits because they made an approach to a much more massive object at a particular moment in time. That object being the mysterious Planet Nine. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. OK, let's take a break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you an opportunity to check out their service. Audible have over 180,000 different titles to choose from, such as Contact by Carl Sagan or A Brief History in Time by Stephen Hawking. Others include the unabridged version of The Hobbit by R.R. R. Tolkien, Divergent by Veronica Roth, and Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen. So many great books, no matter what your taste. Over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or you can click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. SpaceX has announced plans to send two space tourists on a trip to the moon. The flight, slated for late next year, will use the company's new Dragon V2 capsule and its Falcon Heavy launch vehicle. Based on the existing Dragon capsule, the V2 is designed to transport crews of six to the International Space Station as part of NASA's commercial crew program. SpaceX also plans to use a modified version of the Dragon V2, known as the Red Dragon, on an unmanned mission to Mars within the next few years. 
The company says two private citizens approached SpaceX with the moon flight proposal. Both have already paid significant deposits for the week-long trip, which would orbit the moon and then travel deeper into space before swinging back to Earth. While SpaceX won't say exactly how much the trip will cost each space tourist, the company's CEO Elon Musk says it's comparable to the price NASA pays for a seat to the space station aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket. That started at around 20 million US dollars for a return ticket. But once Moscow realized they could make some real money out of it, the price suddenly jumped to around 80 million dollars a seat. SpaceX planned to fly the Dragon V2's maiden flight later this year as an unmanned mission, with a capsule slated to begin taking crew to the space station in 2018. The Lunar Tourist mission will likely go ahead after that, with medical tests and training to commence later this year. The only fly in the ointment at present is NASA, who may delay human spaceflight rating certification until 2019, exactly 50 years since man first walked on the moon. Jonathan Nally is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Well, they haven't released much information, have they? Funny about that. What have they said? They've said that they've got a couple of people who shall remain anonymous for the moment, remain nameless until they pass their medicals, hopefully, who have put down a deposit. Now, they haven't said how much is the deposit uh, and they haven't uh, said how much the whole thing will cost. Now, that's basically a journey around the moon, basically where you do a figure eight, you come back. You know, you, they put it on a, into what's called a free return trajectory. So you head off to the moon, you loop around and you come back again. That's a great way to do it. They did say cryptically that they would do that and he, then head into deep space and go further than anyone's gone into deep space. Well, yeah, I, what does that mean? That was the interesting part of the uh, whole announcement that I picked up as well. What do they mean by going further, just so they get a good view of the moon and the Earth in the one shot? I really don't quite understand what they're talking about there. I, I just don't know what they're up to. Um, maybe they're saying that the particular trajectory they will go on might take them, what, 100 or 1,000 kilometres beyond what the Apollo astronauts did. Well, good on them, but big deal. But the further out you go into deep space presents problems because you have to keep the people alive and everything. But also it means that uh, when you start back on your return trajectory, you pick up more speed. So they're going to hit the atmosphere at a great rate of knots. This is part of the problem with coming back from the moon. That's what they solve for the Apollo missions and what they have to solve again for any new missions that go to the moon's distance. Because when you start coming back from the moon, it's basically like going downhill. You're coming downhill into the Earth's gravitational well and you pick up a lot of speed, much greater speed speed than you do just coming back down from Earth orbit. So you're going to have to um, have, you know, the heat shields and everything you need to protect yourself against that and also design a uh, entry trajectory that doesn't kill the people with too many Gs, particularly if they're just ordinary civilians who aren't accustomed to uh, the sort of Gs that fighter pilots are accustomed to pulling, which is what a lot of the Apollo astronauts were, or pretty much all the Apollo astronauts were, of course. They're all about 5 Gs in that, weren't they? Whereas the space shuttle only ever reached about 3 Gs on, during its launch and descent. Th this is the difference because, yeah, coming back from the moon you're picking up a lot of speed so i don't really know what uh, spacex are talking about there about going further than, in, than anyone else certainly if they do this they will have gone further than anyone since the mid-1980s when one of the space shuttle missions went up to about 850 k's i think it was and that was the furthest anyone had been away from the earth since 1972 when the last apollo manned mission went to the moon so what else do we know um we know that the uh, there's a company i think they call space adventures they're the ones who brokered these high flying pardon the pun high flying uh, high paying space tourists that went up with the russians there's an american millionaire there was a british millionaire there was a billionaire from south africa That's that's right. One was called Mark Shuttleworth. What a good name, Shuttleworth, going up to space. Shuttle. Anyway, um, that company had been advertising for a long, long time that the Russians were perfectly willing, for anyone who could stump up the money, to lay on this very kind of a mission. They'd use their well-proven, very reliable Soyuz capsule and Soyuz rocket to launch someone on a, a mission just to a loop around the moon and come back. I don't know whether they even would have done any orbits of the moon and come back. But the price that was being uh, rumoured all this time was $100 million US dollars, right? So uh, SpaceX, even if they did it for half that price, well, when you think about it, the original price which Russia was charging America for a seat on a Soyuz to the International Space Station was around 20 million US dollars for the return ticket. But when they realised how much money they could be making from NASA, that price suddenly jumped to 80 million dollars a return seat. It certainly did, and those space tourists didn't pay anything near that, so the Russians uh, had the had the whole uh, getting into orbit business tied up, so they could charge what they wanted to do exactly. And that's the reason, actually, by the way, that uh, there haven't been any more of these, you know, wealthy space tourists going up to the 
space station with the Russians because the Americans bought up all the spare seats on the Russian flights. They had to pay whatever it took because the space shuttles were no more. After the space shuttle Columbia was destroyed in re-entry, what, 2003, the, the plan was let's quickly finish the space shuttle program and then give some seed money out to uh, private companies, one of which is SpaceX, to uh, develop a private industry of getting people into space. Uh, you know, the government should get out of running a bus service into, into orbit and let private industry handle that. So that, that still left them with the problem, though, we still want to get astronauts up to the space station. How are we going to do that? The Russians are the only thing going, so the Russians could just charge what they like, of course, and why wouldn't you, to get people up into space? So basic, basically, America bought up all the spare seats that the Russians had, and that's why you haven't had any more of these tourists going up. So once the Americans are back into space with their own indigenous spacecraft, whether it's a SpaceX Dragon capsule or uh, um, a couple of the other ones that are being developed in the States, as soon as that's going and it's all proven and, and they're doing flights again, I think Russia will have a few spare seats. So you might see some more high-flying, pardon the pun again, space tourists going back up with the Russians. Because we're getting to that somehow, stage now where people like Virgin Galactic, and I'm not saying that because space time is featured on Virgin flights, but uh, Virgin Galactic are about to start their space tourism campaign as well with their own spacecraft about to begin uh, going to the edge of space 100 kilometres up, the official start of space the Cayman line. Well that's right um, of course the, the Virgin Galactic flights when they get going will be fabulous stuff and what is it, price about, about $200,000 is it? I think uh, I believe so, yeah. A ticket. yeah. Yeah, roughly, roughly $200,000 is the, is the price you hear quoted around the place for a ticket and that takes you up to about a, a 100 k's or a little bit over in altitude uh, up to where uh, the sort of past the dividing line between Earth and space if you like, although there's still atmosphere up there. But that's a whole different kettle of fish to actually going into orbit and it's much much more expensive of course to go into orbit and far more expensive to head off to the moon and back. So um, in summary, SpaceX has done a really good job in a really short space of time, Elon Musk developing this rocket company and doing things that uh, all the other big aer aerospace companies that have been around for years and years and years said couldn't be done or would be too expensive, whatever, such as bringing your, your, your launch vehicle back down and landing it to reuse it, all these sorts of wonderful things. They've done fabulous stuff and, and you know, their rocket flights are a lot cheaper than, than other rockets, so they're doing great stuff. So all credit to them for where they've got to so far and you know, other things they're working on. As for this Going around the moon business, I don't know whether you'd call me a cynic or a skeptic or a bit of both or, or what, but... What, you I'll wouldn't do it if they offered you a seat? I know oh, I would. They offered me. If they offered me a seat, but I don't have $50 million to pay them for it. So that, that's the thing. So someone's got to pay for it. And will these people really stump up in the end and pay for it? Will it get regulatory approval? I don't know. Uh, look, you're talking years still before this might happen because the, the SpaceX Dragon capsule is not yet rated to take people. They haven't done their test flights. They haven't done the flight, first flights of the, the brand new rocket they want to use. So there's still a lot that needs to be done and settled down before it can be done. And look, it can be done. And if anyone's going to do it, they'll do it. But but uh, let's just wait and see, I think, um, whether this actually happens. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.